Mark, uh, this is old man Douglas, and um, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing on the telephone <coughs> because of standing in front of trombone sections too long. Schedule and was fading in and out mentally. 
This is the same guy who had been so healthy all his life that he retired with unused sick pay amounting to over an extra year of full-time work. Thank, she says thanks for the cash city of Albany, but she really means the school district. <laughs> so the fact that was struck in bed, he was struck in bed was a plain sign to all of us that he was in the process of dying from old age. It seemed to me the best way I could help out would be to sit with Dad so Steve could get a few things done around the house, deal with hospice care folks, and maybe even get a little sleep. So pretty much I did. All I did for the three days of my visit was sit with Dad in his room. His mind had gotten fuzzy over the past years, and now it was obvious that he was only partially present in this world. He never said a word to anyone but Steve anymore. He couldn't move or even open his eyes more than a crack. He was in some pain from various problems of advanced age, and he could hear that pain by the sounds he made. I know this must be distressing for you to hear, and it was, of course, extremely painful for me. My father always said that living to an old age is a mixed blessing, and here I can see the proof. Steve offered to bring me something to read, which I, while I kept watch, the dad's room was crammed with books, so instead I picked up a book off the shelf. Where There's a Will by John Mortimer. I knew Dad loved this book. He'd even sent me a copy. I picked a random chapter and started reading out loud. Dad didn't open his eyes, didn't say anything, but his very stillness let me know he was paying attention. It struck me that even though his mental capacities were failing, his mind and soul were still with us for one last short while. We're talking about one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever known. So it also struck me that he must be bored crazy, just lying in bed with nothing to do but take medications to dull the pain. So on that first day of my visit, I read. We got through many chapters of John Mortimer. I tried reading the newspaper too, but the sounds he made when I read about our current president were so happy. So we gave up on that. I also tidied up his room, humming, because humming always reminds me of my late mother, and I hoped it might have the same effect on him. Everything was otherwise very still and quiet, except that there was a little bird that kept perching at the window, pecking on the glass. When, at the day, end of the day, I went back to my motel room, I posted a note on Dad's Facebook to let his friends and former students know his life was coming to an end. If they had any final words, now would be the time to say them. When I woke up the next morning, there were already more than 50 messages, beautiful messages of how my father had helped people grow up, helped them survive high school, taught them about music and life, even led some to become professional musicians and teachers. I read these messages out loud to Dad. If he'd showed signs of attention when I read the John Warner book, now I saw that attention multiplied by a hundred. As I read each message, he was perfectly still, attentive. In between messages, he groaned and fidgeted and showed other signs of distress. But as soon as I started reading again, he listened to each name and each message in perfect stillness. And more messages kept coming in, sometimes too fast for my below average telephone coping skills. But with some help from Patty Meister, Marcus Punt, and others, I managed to find them and read them to Dad. And every single time, as I read the name and the words, I saw in Dad that same stillness and perfect attention. My brother Peter and his wife arrived from Germany, and then my brother Mike, who lives up in Arcata. John and Pauline, who live in the Bay Area, came by too. Dad still didn't talk directly to anyone but Steve. I have a feeling he thought the rest of us might be a hallucination. But we sat with him and talked to each other about our lives. He may not have caught all the details of these conversations, but I think in the end he was aware that we'd all come together for him. A couple of ex-students messages linked music. At first I skipped those links, since my ancient cell phone still doesn't handle that type of thing well. But on the third day, Steve helped me get Dad's computer going. So that day, after I read all the new messages I could find and read his last month's worth of email to him, I clicked the music linked on Kim Denton's post. Now, 76 trombones isn't quite the thing you'd usually think to play for a dying man. 
No angelic harps there, but he obviously enjoyed it. Not with the same focus he showed when hearing from students, but with a look on his face that let me know he focused on something other than pain. So I played him music. He liked it. I know that because he was very vocal about things he doesn't like. For example, he complained furiously when YouTube played an ad for pain relievers. <laughs> but once the ad stopped and we were listening to Mozart, we were both listening attentively. On the middle of that day, Steve, who has power of attorney for healthcare, made the painful decision, but necessary, to increase Dad's dosage of pain medication. From that point on, Dad was finally out of pain, but he was also out of reach. He slept from that point on and died in his sleep a few days later. I had to go back to my home and my job, but my brother stayed by him, keeping Dad company and playing more music. The number one reason I wanted this memorial to happen is to tell every one of you the last thing my father Ernest Douglas experienced on earth was hearing how much his life meant to others. He lived to the age of 94. He was the best father anyone could wish for. He loved and cherished my mother, and he helped an astonishing number of people become better musicians, teachers, and human beings. So even though I'm kind of pathetic money-wise and when I could not scrape up the funds to come out and be with you today, please be happy. Your affection and appreciation for my dad meant the world to him in his last days. He lived well and died knowing his life made a difference. Enjoy this live show, and any latecomers, please feel free to find a seat because there are several, and there's a whole row in front here. <laughs> and during this live show, we'll be enjoying one of Mr. Douglas's compositions. It's a romance for solo violin, and our musicians today are Suzanne Seaman and Susie Sargent on violin, Liz Lamson on the beloved viola, and Rusty Saxon on, on cello.
Is there anyone right now that would like to come up and say a few words about Mr. Pepper? If you would like to come up, George? Can I call you George now? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Up for 33 years. <laughs> I would like to start because we started in 1954 when. Tell us your name. George Vasilius. <laughs> the red hand over there now, silver, is Cynthia Lane. Anyhow, we, uh, we started in 1954 as eighth graders because that's the way it was then, five year high school, one of two left in California. And uh, so we got five years of Mr. Douglas. <laughs> and early on, he decided I was not going to be first chair of clarinet material. So he said, why don't you try this E flat soprano clarinet? Which was great because that meant I could just sit next to the piccolo player. We had our own shrill section. <laughs> and we also had the, uh, the back seat of the fan bus going to and from Liverpool and places like that. So that resulted in a marriage that's lasted uh, 52 years and 363 days. <laughs> so uh, anybody uh, go from the Albany High Band to the Cal Band? Go Bears, we have some there, yes. Um, so it, somehow we, he instilled in us the love of music and we've been singing in choirs ever since we were 14. And uh, um, I've done choir directing and we had an Albany El Cerrito Choir Festival for about 12 years on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And I was recently re recycled as a choir, church choir director again. So music has been part of our lives. Music keeps you together. Music makes the world go around. And that's enough for me, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to say something? Uh, my name is Dan Corbello. Uh, I first met Ernie 66, 65. Actually, met him a little bit earlier than that because my older sister is also playing music. Every one of my siblings uh, spent at least four or five years playing music with Ernie. I played in every music group Albany High School had. I was one of the first members of the Albany Community Orchestra back then. Um, and just what an incredible guy. Just great memories all around. And I would, and 
And when we get there, I mean, clear, clear, he, he could see in my eyes that I was disappointed that I didn't make it up to the front of the snare line, and he just pulled me aside and said, Tim, you know, you really have the most important job in the band. Don't take it lightly. And I'm like, what is he talking about? You know, this is the bass drum. I got carried this giant thing around the parades. And then, and then so one of the first rehearsals we have, we're, we're on the basketball courts rehearsing and stuff, and I miss a beat, and the whole band trips over their feet and almost falls down. And I go, oh, that's what you mean by important role. Okay. <laughs> and, and to this day, I'm a professional bassist, electric bassist, and it's just, it's just really, uh, just that, that learning experience they attracted me to low-end instruments just because uh, even though it's not the flashy job that everybody notices, I feel very important in my support in the band, so that's thanks to him. I'm, it encouraged me to move on and take pride in my role.
but uh, but a, a lot of the a lot of Mr. Douglas keeps coming out of my mouth when I'm <laughs> when I'm when I'm doing that. You know, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Prax at home, <laughs> or uh, episode report card, or uh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, you know, well, that, 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 that's true, too. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one. Letter A is an A. What's that? Letter, start, letter A is an A. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, but a lot of this stuff just, I get it, just, it just uh, keeps coming out of my mouth, and I go, oh, that's Mr. Douglas. And so I mentioned that, I mentioned that to my kids. And so anyway, he keeps recycling through and through, through all of us that had him, you know, in one way or another. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm uh, proud to have been a student of his, and uh, again, he's had a big, big uh, um, influence as to the direction my life took, and uh, it's pretty, it's been a pretty good life, you know. Um, and anyway, um, just thank you, Mr. Nicholas. We have time as we go further into the um, different presentations that we have. We have, you want to come for your next piece to play? <laughs> My dog's trying to take over the podium. <laughs> we have notes that Kathy wrote about the different pieces that um, Mr. Douglas Propose. This one is Galatea. Note that the pieces on this program were originally written for viola quartet, but are being played today by a quintet. More violas equals always a good thing. <laughs> Galatea 2010 is inspired by the ancient Pygmalion legend. The sculptor Pygmalion created a statue of a woman that was so perfect that he fell in love with it. He implored the goddess Aphrodite to make it human. The goddess complied and Pygmalion married his creation. Okay, I'm supposed to read first. Sorry. Several plays and movies have used the basic idea of this legend. I've often thought that Galilea, the statue to Statue turned woman got a pretty raw deal. Pygmalion chose to love her, but she had no options in choosing a husband. Being a perfect woman must have been a hard thing to live with. The quartet is supposed to be romantic, so it has to be played with a lot of vibrato. Making a big deal of the fermentus, stretching them out, the tempo changes will be troublesome, but the piece is easy to play and very short. Your old friend, Ernie. Don't know what's got into me this past year. I keep writing these romances and arranging Elizabethan love songs. Maybe it's just a nostalgia for a lost youth. I don't know. Now that's out of my system. Maybe now I'll write something like Serenade for a Leaf Blower. <laughs>
Laura. He uh, was a trump very fine trumpeter who graduated in 1972. He is living in Seattle and couldn't be here today, but he did want me to share this with you. I think I was 11 when I first met Ernie, something I would never have called him. He was always Mr. Douglas. It was summer school band at Cornell School before entering eighth grade. The black brass players, mostly trumpets, were hugely outnumbered by the hordes of girls with flutes and clarinets. <laughs> there were virtually no low voices. Just acquainted a few days, Mr. Douglas pulled me aside and handed me a baritone. It seemed huge. I need a bass line and king of the road. Don't worry, it's just like trumpet, only bigger. <laughs> I knew then that I couldn't wait to be this guy's band. I certainly didn't realize as a student, nor do I think any of us did then, the level of commitment it takes to hold a music department such as this one together. He was dedicated to his family, but I was amazed that Ernie was always there, early or late, weekends for performances and competitions. As a student, you sometimes take this for granted, but now as a parent, I marvel at the time he spent and only wish that my children had been as fortunate to find someone like this to nurture their musical abilities. Sure, he had his moments of disciplinary Tourette's, but it, was, <laughs> but it was always over rowdy behavior or inattention, and we understood that. I rifled through every single piece in the music library and pulled out and played the first trumpet parts. Uh, sorry, trumpet players in the community orchestra. Uh, some of those missing parts are probably my fault. <laughs> he saw how interested I was in being in the band room and practicing. So along with Bobby Onweller, he gave us pre-signed, unlimited hall passes to get there between classes and at study halls. Sure, we abused it a bit and handed some of them out to our friends. And sure, Mr. Couch, the vice principal, cracked down a bit. But Ernie just shrugged it off and gave us some more. He loved a little bit of craziness. My junior year, he created a harmony class for credit. It was a great learning experience, giving me a head start when I went to Cal and began arranging for the band and some other small groups. I still had that old red piston harmony book until I passed it on to my younger daughter when she did music theory in her senior year in high school. He continued his service as assistant conductor of YPSO, Young People's Symphony Orchestra. No small feat to be both in charge of the music and in control of the musicians. YPSO had an age range up to 21, making it even more difficult. I was glad to see him selected, though it seemed he frequently had to operate under the ever supercilious gaze of the director. Still, he was our guy from Albany, our representative. I loved having him there, even though I'd heard all his punchlines before. <laughs> we went on tour with the group to the International Festival of Youth Orchestras the summer of 1973. He and the parent chaperones tried their best to protect us from the legal beer and other shenanigans. Despite meeting out the necessary discipline, on the podium he was always encouraging, as he was when, in Aberdeen, I absentmindedly screwed up and entered the brass round in the symphonic metamorphosis eight bars too early. When I approached him later to apologize, the Hanson boys and the rest of the strings were already all over me. He merely said, but we all ended together. And <laughs> and pulling the group back together again. And, well, it was a round, after all. <laughs> Later that same trip, Katie McElroy and I were selected to be in the festival orchestra, which was directed by a very ancient Leopold Stokowski and scheduled uh, to perform Tchaikovsky's Fifth in Royal Albert Hall. I still remember the first rehearsal, attended by directors and parents. The first horn, a young guy from the Netherlands, played the iconic solo in the Andante beautifully, until Stokowski abruptly stopped him and berated him for his lack of emotion. <laughs> the kid was almost in tears. When I told Ernie later how shocked he was, he looked downcast and said something to the effect that one should never so harshly criticize a young performer, particularly in front of the group. To behave this way was the complete antithesis of his style. I loved him for that defense. I think it was my senior year that Ernie programmed the Virgin de la Macarena trumpet solo made popular by Rafael Mendez. It has its share of upper range bits. It went well, and as I finished, I turned to Ernie and saw him as he always was after performing a piece, beaming and holding his baton turned backwards between his fingers applauding his students. He called to the crowd in the gym, would you like to hear that again? <laughs> 
I turned to him, a little horrified, protesting that my lip was checking out for the night. Ah, oh, don't worry, you'll make it. And he turned and gave the damn beat. And that's how it was with Doug. With a little extra encouragement, we were able to make it just a little bit further the next time. And I believe that we have all made it a bit further because of his style and gentle leadership. Ernie will be greatly missed. Note from Mr. Douglas about jobs. <coughs> One more very short piece. I have to I have to do this from time to time, or my fingers forget how. This is a little thing I wrote for Joss, the same some time ago, arranged for violas. For some reason, I've been spending a lot of time in doctors' waiting rooms lately, reading medical pamphlets about toenail fungus and varicose veins, and getting, and getting bored stiff. To pass the time, I started working on a viola quartet to practice writing in alto and clef. That clef messes up my mind, and I need the practice. I'm sending it along in case the viola nation ever gets together again. <laughs> Have you noticed that all medical people say, okay, a lot? Like, now we're going to stick this little needle in your neck for just a tiny minute, okay? <laughs> when they get around to nagging me for my sins, the hangman will probably say something like, now we'll just put this nice little, little rope around your neck and pull it tight, okay? <laughs> Note about Mary. This is an arrangement of Mary is a Grand Old Name by George M. Cohen.
here. Craig, are you? Hi. There you are. I, I recognize you from high school, but you know, that was a while ago. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Craig Bryant, and uh, I'm the band orchestra teacher at Albany High School for the last 10 years. Um, it's been really heartwarming to hear all the wonderful stories about Ernie today, and although we only met a handful of times, I feel a really strong connection to him because of that special room we both spent countless hours in, the Albany High School band room. A colleague of mine expresses it much more eloquently than me, but the gist of what he says is, it's that place that has seen everyone at their best and worst. It's watched families been created and families fall apart. They've seen love between two people and one-sided crushes. They've seen your most joyous days and maybe melancholy ones as well. And they have seen the person that, that you were when you entered for the first time and now the person that you have become when you leave for the last time. It's just a room, but it is a pretty special place. Ernie is a legend of Albany, and his mark is still there in the school music program and all over our town. A, a few short stories. I first heard about Ernie from my predecessor, Tom Lilienthal. I think he was just here, but he had to leave. Um, Tom was there for almost 10 years before I started. And uh, so I met Tom to pick up the keys to the band room. And Tom counted Ernie as a mentor. And when I got the job in Albany, I felt part of a strong lineage. And that became stronger as, as I've taught there. I have had really great chaperones and supportive parents during my time at Albany, and many of those are former students of Ernie, whose children were or are now in the band program, are going to be soon. Um, I heard about the musicals, the marching bands, the jazz band, the bus trips, early mornings, late nights, and a genuine love for their teacher and the experiences he gave them. I was having a drink one night with my wife over the Hotsi Totsi. <laughs> And after overhearing some stuff about, I was probably ranting about the school day, you know, to my wife, this random guy walks up to me and goes, he confessed that even though he wasn't a great bank at Mr. Douglas, had continued to let him play piano on his free period in the little theater and discuss uh, pop culture and music at the time. And he says he was a horrible pianist, but he, he remembered vividly how nice Ernie was to him about that. I've seen Teresa lead the adult school and Albany Chamber Orchestra, and I've gained a new appreciation for the value of community music making in adults. And certainly an appreciation for the great literature that Ernie programmed, arranged, and composed with all of his musicians over the years. When I got the job at Albany, I attended an end of year performance, and I had a student walk up and introduce themselves to me and tell me, uh, welcome to Albany. That doesn't really happen anywhere else. Uh, Albany kids and families are special and I grow to appreciate that more each year. Every mid-June, I take one final look at the band room before I close the door for a few weeks away and enjoy a vacation. In the past, I'd usually let out a solitary yelp of happiness for getting to the end of another school year, but this year, I looked at the room and had simply said this, thank you. Thanks for, being, uh, thanks for the fun times with students, thank you for the music, and thank you for being a familiar and safe place on campus. That's the sentiment I think many of us feel towards Mr. Douglas. Thanks for sharing your passion for music, and thanks for creating a lasting culture in Albany. I am representing Albany Music Fund here today. They are an evolution of the AHS Music Boosters, and now we are a group that supports K-12 music education in the Albany Unified School District. Elementary music, band, jazz, orchestra, choir, guitar class, and everything else you hear in Albany. Albany is a special place because of the strong support for school music, but the community, and although some things change about, I'm sorry, strong support for the music and the community, and although some things change about the music program over the years, the essence is still there. These are the best kids in Albany, making music, putting on concerts and shows, going on trips to festivals and competitions, playing at community events around Albany, and enriching the lives of Albany students. Ernie's mark on this will always be apparent. And I'm incredibly appreciative of um, donations that um, might come to Albany Music Fund as, as a result of this memorial. But more than anything, I, I hear your stories, and we just finished another school year. I'm at a weird nexus in my life. This is my first Father's Day, and my dad was my high school band teacher. Oh. And um, so it, it's a lot of uh, different emotions, but um, 
to hear you guys tell these stories. The kids are different names, but they're all, the, you know, it's like I see you in them, and it's really wonderful to hear that. And uh, thank you, Ernie, and thank you guys very much.
very quickly put together plans and, and was able to come down and join my dad and join the family in doing that. So um, I appreciate Mike for doing that. Um, and my brother uh, Peter uh, traveled from Berlin uh, with his wife Katja. And um, again, on very short notice, you know, and be, being able to kind of come up with a, a plane ticket. Again, you know, the, the timing was not great, but he made it happen. And I'm um, deeply appreciative to, to him for doing that. Um, and I uh, also, also want to thank very much um, my brother Steve. Um, Steve served as the primary caretaker for my dad um, during the last years of his life and um, had um, uh, immeasurably difficult work to do uh, in the last uh, weeks and days and uh, just did an, an absolutely tremendous job. So uh, Steve is here with us, so I think you know, I would like him to hear your applause. <laughs>
thank you to everyone who participated today. I think we all just feel a little better about our laws and a little more lucky than we even realized. Um, so there, there's food, there's water, there's a memory book, and there are a few signs telling you where to go on the internet to get your own PDF copy if you want that. And please sign the uh, guest book at the front uh, table there because we do want to send that on to Kathy so she can uh, see who was here today. And uh, enjoy socializing with your uh, fellow musicians. Thank you so much for coming. And, um, oh, one final thing. Since Marcus is uh, recording this, the good news is it's going to be on YouTube. <laughs> Not necessarily good news for me personally, but uh, for all of us, it's a good thing. So look for it there. It's for Kathy. Yes. Hi, Kathy. Bye.